Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's just start with the first of our panels. That's, uh, we are going to be taking a look at the economic impact of the internet. We've been talking about some of the transformation that is perhaps possible. Is it going to end up transforming the economy of India? And if so, in what manners? And I'd like to invite a very special panel up here. I'm going to begin by Anu Madhgaukar, who's a senior fellow at McKinsey Global Institute. Anu, why don't you come up? Um, has done a lot of work in researching and in investigating the full scope of the internet here in India. Elizabeth Bramson Bodro from the Economist uh, Intelligence Unit uh, has been really looking at a number of sectors and in specifically what's going to happen on the internet. Deep Kalra, founder and CEO of MakeMyTrip.com, perhaps one of the most successful internet entrepreneurs um, here in, in the country. Um, Deep, please do join us. Right. Um, you know, there used to be a time when if we were doing a panel like this, we would be all sitting in a room having a conversation. Now, look at the power of the internet already. This is buzzing all over the place in a number of manners that no one would have thought. I've been seeing people, a lot of people right here in, in, in this room are tweeting about it. This is rolling out live on NDTV.com. It's going out on air. There's discussion on cyberspace. The entire concept of having a conversation now is increasingly becoming a public and an internet conversation. I guess the big question that we are here to answer in the next you know, 30, 40 minutes is, is it going to transform the economy as well? If so, to what extent? And how far will that process go? Will it only be a section of people who will benefit from the internet? Or will it actually go down all the way to the most remote of villages and you know, to the bottom of the pyramid? And why don't you start off first, because you have done some research on this. What have been your findings? The first layer is sort of the direct economic impact, right? The impact that comes because households, individuals like you and me, um, SMEs, large businesses, all of us invest in hardware, software services, and telecom because these enable us to use internet services that we value. And even if you just look at the direct impact of that level of spending, it's actually huge. So globally, we estimate that if you thought about all of the spending as an industry, like you did many other industries, uh, it would be roughly 3% of global GDP, which is about $1.7 trillion worth of spending, which is internet motivated. And in India, that number currently would be about $30 billion, which is about 1.6% of our GDP. Uh, projected to rise to about $100 billion, to your question in terms of what's the forward-looking potential of this, about $100 billion by 2015, which would make just direct internet-related economy uh, at least as big as the healthcare sector uh, in terms of share of GDP. It would make it bigger than the education sector. And let's just take a look at some of the more advanced, if you like, internet economies where a lot of things are really moving there, whether it's the United States, South Korea, places like that. To what extent is the, has the internet had an impact on their economy? What we, def we definitely see is certainly within Asia, South Korean um, and Japanese uh, entrepreneurs and business leaders experience a quite a different set of, um, of challenges. They're much more competitive challenges. Um, here in India, the challenges are of a, of, a different, of a different sort and are much more about really trying to get a lot of the momentum built in the first place. All right, Deep, tell us about the internet economy, seeing as you, perhaps more than anyone else in this, you know, here has really benefited massively from sure. it. Sure. I think the stats shared by Anu and by Elizabeth are really compelling. Uh, it, it indeed is true that this is probably one of the fastest growing sectors in itself today worldwide. When all other sectors are pretty much stagnating, you have the internet really powering on 8% in developed countries, 18% in, uh, in developing countries. And in India too, uh, I think what Sam said is very true. We should really focus on what lies ahead. Because if we look back, uh, I think there are only a couple of things which have probably gone right. And in all fairness, uh, I think uh, you have to give credit to the government for a couple of things they did right. But overall, I think the scorecard, Vikram, is quite dismal. It's a big fallacy when we say that 10% of India is online. 10% of India is on narrow band. That's not online. You don't begin to harness the true potential of the internet if you're on narrow band. 1% of India is truly online, is on broadband, and that's the part which has to grow leaps and bounds. And dare I say, I think that thunder is going to get probably stolen completely by the mobile simply because not enough has been done around a broadband pol policy uh, from the government. So I think there we've had a really, really sad track record. 
and we it would have been a different story right now i know at the end of the day you know we all know what the promise of the internet is and we all know how much it could transform everything but as deep says the actual experience has not necessarily been as great as we thought uh one of the things that really comes out through our research where we benchmarked india with a pool of 57 other countries which is a fair mix of both you know advanced economies as well as developing countries at similar levels of gdp per capita and we found that in terms of almost all the enablers of a strong internet ecosystem india actually was bottom quartile mm. and in many cases uh, you know 50 and 52 ranked out of 57 right uh, and this really reflects uh, a lot of the traditional historical lacunae in in internet infrastructure above all else i think what's really impressive is that despite that we have a vibrant um ecosystem of internet entrepreneurs and because demogra you know demographic factors are in our balance or in our favor uh you do actually have urban and young india adopting the internet in larger numbers so if you just double click on the 10% internet penetration you actually find that you know rural penetration is less than 2% urban penetration is actually reasonably good at about 25% and and you compare that then to the philippines or uh, vietnam or parts of brazil which are more urbanized you actually find but that adoption could, rates are quite high but if i could just interrupt you the the penetration might be 25% yeah. but as as he said at what speeds it. what's the connectivity what can you actually do with that internet connection is another point i mean if you're struggling to get email on it uh the, then that's that's rather sad no and that's borne out by the facts as well which is that uh, typically uh you know an indian online consumer is spending one fourth the time of his southeast asian counterparts online uh and and the quality of that experience is not great but uh i think potentially there is a another model that we have to uh plan for for india right even in even in a base case view even if you don't think about internet going to you know 200000 villages if you just think about the number of internet users going up three times to about 350 million you i think india will be unique in that three fourths of this growth is likely to be mobile and tablet only right and it's almost the only country in the world which has this kind of outlook a lot of people who are in the internet in india have already realized this some time back and their focus is really largely mobile driven or device driven certainly yeah absolutely i think anu's right in saying that uh, in india people are going mobile first and because you know there is no alternative in a sense <clears throat> so we actually have some really exciting apps happening in india right now and developments happening in india which are mobile only there are some in the us a few but a lot of folks have taken a cue from those so if you look at a very exciting company out here called zomato uh which is you know modeled on open table uh in in the US Zomato is seeing growth rates of their mobile penetration going absolutely berserk so apparently they've gone from like 30 40% to 60% in the last 6 months now if someone was to take a cue from that and it could be a local cab company it could be someone aggregating uh, taxis they'd say why should i build a big screen application at all what's the need why wouldn't i just go mobile only and focus because we all know it's all about focus out here whether you know it's this phenomenal company called google or anyone else it was all about focus on one thing but that won't solve all the problems is what i feel so just for a minute if we stick with sme and which is so exciting for our country because our country is really going to get driven by uh the sme engine and that's pretty clear to everybody so if you look at smes and i think this is a mckinsey study or probably one of the other folks who said that small and medium enterprises that embraced the internet over the last i guess decade grew 10% mm. however those who didn't actually declined mm. so i think the message is clear for small and medium enterprises you either embrace the internet you internetize your business or you run the risk of perishing now that's the kind of business which may not take off and i'm going to take an example uh, which necessitates me taking two bad words in one sentence but i'm going to talk about uh, china and alibaba together so you know no mm -hmm. offense but if you think about it and from google's point of view of course so if you think about alibaba in china that company is just phenomenal in terms of the fact that millions of smes have come on board this yeah. platform almost it's a company but it's actually a platform and have reached out to millions of customers around the world they could have never done and this is helped the overall economy and i find that one example could work so beautifully for india
full potential of the internet is still a promise and not an actuality. What do you think, taking from global experiences, what do you think that India has done wrong so far, mm. which it might try and fix now? Generally speaking, the feeling was that within Asia, so within their sort of home region, oftentimes within the home market, there were big enough challenges that, you know, the, that the global... Um, the global frontier had, yet, had not yet become something that really made sense to put on the agenda. There are some real challenges on the monetization side, which I wonder about um, you know, your perspectives here. So for example, um, if you want to develop a real content business, getting people to understand that you know, sort of paying for content is something that one um, might, you know, might need to do is a bit of a cultural um, disconnect. And also there's obviously some issues with piracy. Um, and so if you're able to get pirated content, why would you pay? But interestingly as well, I think there are challenges in terms of online payments, this difficulty of uh, there's very relatively low uh, credit card penetration. Regulation is something that um, came up. So in terms of what the government's done wrong, you know, there ten tends to be an, uh, a, an inclination to shut down the site rather than to ask for that um, perhaps uh, fraudulent content to be removed. Although we're sort of reluctant to get into a it's the government's fault or it's not the government's fault kind of argument, what we're trying to do is bring out what we heard from the, the people who are actually doing business here. Right, Deep, um, you probably relate to a lot of that. And let's start off with monetization though, for, pure, for the pure internet, right, uh, internet companies. In India, there seems to be a real problem because <clears throat> if you look at the amount that's going in in advertising, for example, so let's look at the content players, the amount that you're getting for advertising right. is, is almost laughable when you compare to equivalent benchmarks anywhere else in the world. And then you have the transactional sites or the e-commerce sites and other than you or a couple of others, most have really struggled to make money. So how do you monetize the internet in India if you're an internet only company? Yeah, no, I think that was a fair comment. I think if you're uh, largely a content play uh, in India, it's not that easy simply because uh, it's linked to the kind of time and the quality of time you're spending on the internet. So it comes back actually to the whole rich media experience. Okay. If you have, you know, if you have the ability to enjoy rich but media. But actually, even if you are uh, offering rich media, even in that section, it's not necessarily that easy to monetize. Even if you're looking at people who are watching videos, streams, and the others, they're not necessarily, you're not getting advertisers to pay for that, what you might be able to get in the United yeah, States. Or yeah, the United and States I, th or I, anywhere I think, else. yeah, I think in one of the many roles you've held at NDTV, I think, uh, you know, you've seen that for yourself. It's, it's not been easy. You guys offer rich media. And I'm saying, Vikram, the point is how many guys can consume that rich media in the way that you want them to consume it. Yeah. Um, and the moment it ceases to be a pleasure, uh, then that affects the, the experience. There's also a cultural thing out here, I think. And, you know, most of us Indians know that. Uh, you know, we don't like to pay for stuff which we can get away without paying. I mean, it's yeah. just, it doesn't happen so easily. So actually today payments is not an issue at all. So payments in India, and again, I've got to give credit to the government out here because two-factor authentication changed the game for e-commerce payments in India and fraud in India. Two-factor authentication was one of the boldest moves they made. It was two and a half years ago. I remember transactions for everyone fell off a cliff. You had some time to prepare for it, but then after that, it's fraud which is completely nosedived. The other point is that while credit card holders are only probably 20 million with 40 million credit cards, two per head, but we have about 200 million people with debit cards which are now allowed to be used on the internet as well as net banking. So there's actually no issue out there. We have more people who can pay via plastic or online than people who are actually online. So that's not an issue today. Vernacular is an issue today. I think in vernacular there's actually a huge opportunity today because we don't have good quality content beyond news on vernacular sites. So there's a lot of uh, interest there. But I, I think in terms of monetizing, uh, Vikram, we'll see media pick up. Um, I think the challenge will be as our internet growth gets driven largely on the smaller devices, media becomes a bigger challenge. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening. So on the mobile, everyone's struggling. You know, the biggest of companies, the smartest of companies around the world are trying to figure out how do I monetize my mobile content. All right, we have about three, four minutes more to go. So Anu, if I could just ask you on one of the other things that did emerge from what both the minister, uh, Mr. Kapil Sibal and Sam Petroda were saying, it's about the extent to which the internet can transform lives of people in the most remote parts of the country and at the, at the bottom of the pyramid. I mean, uh, e-governance, I guess, is making an impact, but how about in other areas? I think uh, there again, the promise is immense. 
uh, there are some of these uh, critical enablers, the, you know, the pipes need to be laid and the last mile connectivity needs to be there and then you need a host of vernacular based applications. But uh, there are several areas where we've seen, so for example, um, this whole enablement of uh, 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 cash transfers, right, direct cash transfers, which in a way is enabled through, uh, you know, internet based platform has this huge impact in terms of really uh, plugging leakages, right, which can be as high as 50% in, in many of these cases. Uh, in, the, in the social sector, in health and education, the, some models that we've seen which do leverage the internet bring down the cost per consultation or the cost per, you know, child education intervention down some, you know, to 20% or 10% of uh, what the offline cost would be. So the immense is, uh, the, the potential is just immense. Elizabeth, the, uh, there used to be a time we used to say the internet is going to increase inequality, sharply so, the digital divide. Now what we seem to be hearing is actually it, it could potentially work the other way. Well, I think one of the things that we've seen certainly in um, developing markets elsewhere in the world is the extent to which the internet has given a voice to perhaps um, populations that haven't necessarily been able to speak. So for example, the events in the Middle East during the Arab Spring are, were certainly exemplary in terms of the extent to which people were under, able to understand that they weren't alone and that there was in fact a, a, a whole range of other people feeling the same level of distrust and unease. And obviously we covered that very closely at The Economist and at The Economist Intelligence Unit. And you know, I think we all believe that the extent to which connectivity in the internet was, um, needs to be given a great deal of credit for the okay. events that took place there. So I think that's, um, that's some of it. Deep, final quick thoughts for you. A lot more people traveling now on your portal than were earlier. Yeah, clearly I think business has been uh, good, could be better of course always, but I think more, more important than just traveling, I think it's, uh, it's, it's that default, uh, you know, go-to uh, space. So I've got a 13-year-old and 11-year-old and the harshest punishment we can give them when they've done something wrong is a no screen day. So a no screen day is, is a complete shutdown of everything they do except if they have to use it for work, you know, so they can go to Wikipedia and they can do, they can do it for work. And if you think about it, and I was just thinking about this driving out here, you know, look at our lives. I don't think there's one of us, and this is obviously a skewed audience, but imagine a day without the internet at home, not up in the hills, not out on the sea. It's, it's just something we can't imagine. And for most of us, we got experience to this thing not so long ago. So I think it's just dramatic, it's just fascinating how it's changing our lives. I think the fact that you can be in a remote part of the country and you can watch cricket being streamed on your mobile phone is pretty exciting if you think about it. So you're no longer disconnected. So I think the future is very bright. Right, and let's hope that connectivity continues to improve so you don't end up in those screen days for factors other than being punished because you did something wrong. <laughs> right. Thank, Thank you. you so much.